So yesterday on our, our way back from picking up Morgan at the airport, my, my phone started to ring. And I looked down, and it was Doug Freeburn. That's right, Deacon Doug. It was good to hear his voice. Uh, he said, Nick, I just got the bulletin emailed to me this afternoon, and it says Ascension Day on the front cover. And there was this long pause. Did you mean to do that? I kind of chuckled to myself uh, because for the past week, the clergy page of the diocese's Facebook account has featured a lively conversation discussing liturgical precedence and practice as it relates to the Feast of the Ascension. And so here are some of the takeaways from my colleagues that go straight to the heart of Doug's question. Number one, in light of the pandemic, as much as this feast might seem to be the day uh, that we observe as the day where Jesus actually started working from home, theologically, it means a little more than that. Technically speaking, the Feast of the Ascension is not, I repeat, not a movable feast happening always 40 days after Easter Sunday. You can see the readings from Acts for that, which always puts the Feast of the Ascension on a Thursday, according to Scripture. And that's important, particularly for those of us who hold fast to the triune relationship of Scripture, tradition, and reason. But perhaps the most astute observation of all is that while the readings illustrate Jesus ascending into the heavens, the Feast of the Ascension is not the Feast of Jesus' departure, but rather the Feast of his glorification as Christ takes his place at the right hand of God as he said he would, which has nothing to do with leaving us, but everything to do with fulfilling the promise that he will be with us always. And so, being it that it is Sunday, you're right in assuming that we are breaking every liturgical law known to mankind. But, and we're doing that by observing the prayers and propers from this past Thursday today. I'd like to be able to say that this was by design, that we decided to do this deliberately so that we could draw our attention to what we've conditioned ourselves to do over the course of the past five decades or so, either not observing the feast at all or by moving it out of convenience. But that's not the case, I assure you. The fact is, is it takes years and perhaps decades for a parish who has never really observed feast days on the day, like those of the apostles, and even major feasts of the church's year of grace, like the Feast of the Ascension, uh, uh, to celebrate the, the sanctoral cycle the way the Book of Common Prayer uh, assumes we will. And there is a reason to experience the cycle the way it is, it fulfills a function and a fundamental one at that. And though we may not be there yet, never fear. I assure you that we will get there together. And I think it's absolutely necessary that we do. A few months ago, um, I was having lunch with a friend who was truly struggling. As you might expect, the list of what my friend found challenging in life was quite extensive and from a certain perspective was overwhelming. It was numbing, if not paralyzing. And I've learned that instead of using that precious time that we have together with one another to address and to strategize about how to engage each one of those challenges, that there are more appropriate ways of being a pastor in that space, which most of the time has me listening and then reflecting back what I hear. And this does two very important things. It gives me the space to listen to what is anchoring someone. 
Do they have an anchor? Do they have a harbor? Or are they truly adrift? And if they are adrift, what tackle is available to harness the current? What instruments are available for us to navigate with? And where is the nearest port in the storm? And the other, which is truly a miraculous thing, that's done by everyone, whether they know they're doing this or not, and that is, is that most folks often say the words that they need to hear themselves to heal, they say those out loud and don't know that they're doing it. And so, listening for that thing and then reflecting with someone about their truth is about as holy as the work as I do. Accountability, I've learned, comes as surely as by way of presence as it does by way of witness. And knowing how to leverage and relate the two makes all the difference when it seems that there is nowhere to run and nowhere to hide from things like grief, sadness, and despair. When all of our bearings have been lost in the face of tragedy and consequence. As my friend began to open up, I learned that out of all the things at his disposal, one of the surest anchors that he was holding on to in the storm was his prayer life, which makes all the sense in the world to me. But I know that's not the case for everyone, especially if we feel distance from God. The more I listened, some of what provided my friend with security was indeed the prayers that's been handed to us, handed down to us by the generations, but that wasn't everything. The majority of what allowed my friend to gain some traction was, well, it was through the routine itself. The discipline, you see, of daily corporate prayer. This provided my friend with a still point, right, in a world that is ever moving. And it does so without judgment regardless of whether or not such prayer comes with a breakthrough or indeed an answer. The fact that he became part of the rhythm is what helped more than anything else. And I think that is what observing the sanctoral cycle does for us. It provides something constant in the face of the all too familiar experience of uncertainty that has the circumstances of our lives changing on a dime on a whim, and almost always out of our control. And so there is then a framework that our ancestors have left us to hold us together in times of great upheaval. There is an anchor that can hold us fast in the storm, whether that storm meets us here in Bartlesville or if it meets us in the news and takes us to Buffalo and back or leaves us on our knees in great anguish, watching what has unfolded in Uvalde, Texas, and wanting with all our heart to be, heart to protect, defend, and hold tight those who have been broken and those who have been slain in innocence. Because the fact remains, if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. As with my friend, as with you now, I held on to a pew in here while the world turns itself upside down again this week, and my anchor continues to be our life together. The rhythm of the Paschal mystery, the tears shed together, the grief acknowledged, and the tenderness of holding on to each other as the familiar pathos of this sinful cycle continues. It is in our prayers together that we shall find, I think, the synergy we need. And in the faith given to us to utter the words that we need to hear, to heal. So to us to find this courage to do something with the truth that has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. For our prayer shapes what we believe. And what we believe is essential, is an essential part of 
who we become. And what we become often determines what we do. And as Christians, what we do finds all its meaning in Christ, who through his sacrifice gave us a way, a ministry, a rhythm, and a witness to live into. And you know this because this is often referred to as the way of the cross. Each step taken into the heart of God, each effort to enter into that rhythm is a step closer that we take towards grace, towards love, towards mercy, towards the reality that all of what we hope rests on Christ's sacrifice and our ability to sacrifice in his name what needs to be sacrificed so to as slay the sin of pride. What we sacrifice might just be the thing that ends up saving a life, whether our own or indeed a child's life. And what better way to glorify the Lord than that? A Lord who has not left us orphans as the scripture of the day reveals, but has given us his spirit and the power to change the world through prayer and in his name and action as witnesses of his grace.